In the previous lecture, we saw that primitive recursion is not able to capture all functions that we would um, deem uh, effectively computable. And one such example was uh, the Ackermann function. Um, so we need to look for ways to expand uh, the class of primitive recursion to capture uh, those functions. And in this lecture, we will uh, look at one way to expand those. And this will lead to the recursive or mu recursive functions. Before we do that, however, um, I want to go over an argument that uh, shows that it is not possible to stick uh, with uh, just total functions. So with a framework in which every function is defined for all natural numbers, if we want to have a uh, framework that captures all computable functions. Um, the reason is that any primitive recursive function has a derivation, right? So um, as a kind of a proof that uh, shows how we can derive this function from the basic functions and applications of composition and recursion. Now, sim just like we did it, we can do it for proofs. We can watch uh, or see derivation such a derivation as a finite string over a fixed countable alphabet. And then we can apply the whole machinery of Gödel numberings to it, uh, similar to what we did to Turing machines. And therefore, we can uh, effectively number or list all derivations of primitive recursive functions. So we obtain, in other words, a Gödel numbering of the set of primitive recursive functions. Right. And then we can just say, let f sub n be the primitive recursive function corresponding to the nth derivation in the listing. Now, we can form the following function. Um, g of n is f sub n of n plus 1. So this function would be effectively computable because we could uh, just look, produce um, the nth function in our listing and compute this function on input n and just add 1 to it. So intuitively, this is an effectively computable function, but it cannot be primitive recursive because we just defined by this diagonalization g to be different from any primitive recursive function. And there's actually nothing special about primitive recursion here. Um, this argument applies to any schema that um, we can use uh, to define uh, uh, computable functions that produces only total functions, right? As long as we can list them effectively and retrieve uh, a function given on the index in the list, uh, we can we can implement this uh, function here, right? However, if fn can be partial, that means it's not necessarily defined. So fn of n can be undefined, right? Then gn would be undefined too, and therefore we don't have the diagonalization happening at this, uh, at this point. So for partial functions, this argument does not work. One operation that uh, can lead us out of the uh, total function and lead to partial function, and yet is effective, is the uh, unbounded mu operator. Um, we've already seen the bounded mu operator, where we essentially just looked for the smallest witness to a statement um, bounded that is smaller than a given bound. Uh, now we get rid of this bound, and this hence corresponds essentially to an unbounded search, which of course can lead to an infinite loop if we never uh, find a witness for the condition that we're looking for. So formally, uh, we have a partial function given, um, then the function f obtained from g by application of the mu operator is defined as follows. It's the least y such that g x y is defined and zero. And this is important, we also have to require that um, g is defined for all z less than equal to y. Um, if we don't re um, uh, require this, then the partial recursive functions that we define below will not be closed under this operator. Um, and if 
no such y exists, uh, then we just let f be undefined. So, and then the uh, family of partial recursive functions is the smallest set of partial functions containing the basic functions, zero, successor, and projection, and that is closed under composition, primitive recursion, and now the unbounded mu operator here. And um, it should be clear how you can uh, adjust uh, the notions of composition and primitive recursion to actually apply to partial functions. So whenever you essentially whenever you run at some point of the definition uh, into a partial, so an undefined uh, value, then you just make that function uh, undefined. You carry that undefinedness uh, uh, along in the function that you're currently defining. It is now possible to show that every recursive function is, uh, or partial recursive function rather, is partial computable. And this works uh, by showing that every basic function is Turing computable. Um, we've already discussed this in, in class. Um, and then you show that the partial computable functions are closed under composition, primitive recursion, and the mu operator. Um, and that means that uh, uh, family of Turing computable, partial Turing computable functions contains the uh, partial recursive functions. Um, and here you uh, essentially just give a Turing machine that performs these operations, given Turing machines for uh, the functions that you, for example, want to compose and so on. Um, there's nothing really special about Turing machines here. You can do uh, similar, sometimes even easier proof using other um, uh, frameworks such as the register machines we looked at, um, and so on. Finally, you can also show that um, every partial computable function is partial recursive. And this can be done um, um, through proving what is um, called the Kleene normal form, uh, which says that there exists a primitive recursive predicate t and a primitive recursive uh, function u um, such that the eth Turing computable function uh, phi sub e uh, applied to x is obtained by uh, uh, applying the mu operator to t and then applying uh, u to, res to the result of that uh, function. So this in particular shows that one application of the mu operator is enough. Mm of uh, mu is enough to get all Turing computable functions from the primitive recursive functions. The proof um, of the normal form takes us back to when we first looked at how we can code Turing machines. And at that time, we not only coded um, Turing machine programs, but we also coded computations of Turing machines. If you recall, we encoded the computation of a Turing machine by encoding its configurations, right? The uh, configuration of the, for example, the position of the read-write head, the symbol that is currently scanned, the state that it is in, and so on. And then that sequence, so each uh, configuration could be encoded by a single number. And then the sequence of those configurations, again, is a sequence of numbers and that could be then turned into a single number. And essentially, this predicate now says that y is the code of a halting computation of Turing machine uh, p sub e on input x. Of course, this um, uh, halting comp uh, com uh, computation so might not exist at all. And this y, this uh, search, so this mu operator might lead to an undefined function. But if it is, right, so if there exists such a y, right, if it is halting, then we can um, decode the last configuration, namely the halting configuration, and just uh, count the number of ones on the tape at that uh, state of the, of the Turing machine. So then this then is, of course, our output. And we have seen um, in the uh, in class that all these uh, number theoretic operations 
of coding, encoding, decoding, and so on are uh, primitive recursive, and hence they can be used to define these uh, functions u and t.